Hello, and welcome to another uh, NIDA in conversation. Uh, my name is David Berthold. I'm the director of the Centre of Creative Practices at NIDA. And where I am now, I'm, I'm here on the uh, lands of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, um, and which has really been a place of community and culture and uh, language and creative expression for probably around 60,000 years. I want to pay my respects to elders past, present and future. Um, <clears throat> and of course, the traditional ownership of this land was never ceded. So it always was and always will be. And my guest today is Letitia Caceres. Hello, Letitia. Hello, David. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for having me. No, I'm really looking forward to chatting with you, I must say. You know, one of Australia's great theatre directors, directed for almost you know, all of the theatre companies in Australia and uh, in more recent years venturing into film. Uh, and Atisha is actually creating uh, a new project for NIDA at the moment um, called Six, which we might talk about a little bit later. Uh, Atisha, maybe you give us a little taste of what that's going to be. Uh, we'll talk oh. about that a bit later. Um, I guess I'm going to start, Letitia, by just, I guess, you use the phrase political theatre quite a lot. And, and looking back over, you know, the enormous volume of work you've done, um, I can see that politics in your theatre is, is very important to you. You know, your, the works that you've created um, voice stories that are not often heard and um, centre people that are, you know, often on the outside of power. It's a very recurring thing, I think, for you and your work. And I just, I just want to take you back to a bit of your family history because, you know, it feels to me that there are profound connections between the experience of your family and the work that you do so passionately now, of course, you grew up in Argentina, uh, in Latin America, um, and your family was very much in the, uh, you know, and around and experienced the military coup there that um, you know, right wing dictatorship took over Argentina. And you come from a family of activists there. So um, that was a pretty brutal time in Argentina. So what what if you could share with us some of the kind of family memories of that time? Um, so, um, so the dictatorship in Argentina um, happened in 1976, um, and I was born in 1978. Um, so, you know, the family memories um, that are passed down, I suppose, and the stories are, you know, there's a very a beautiful photo that my parents have of themselves and some friends some, and cousins, and they were all um, looking kind of quite terrified in this image. And it was the day that the coup happened. And I, I you know, there's this kind of sense of, of overwhelming anxiety and, and, and terror at what the future would hold for them. And they look very young and, um, you know, and very idealistic, but also there's this kind of wash of what, what does that mean for us? Um, you know, at that time, um, you know, women during that dictatorship, things like you know, women were women weren't allowed to wear jeans. Um, you know, they, it was it was that kind of basic kind of repression that was happening, as well as obviously the broader um, concerns to do with um, with workers' rights and, um, and 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 equality in a, in a country that's profoundly profoundly unequal. Um, you know, the bulk of the country is in the hands of six families essentially um, and everybody else is, is cut out um, there was there was never any kind of um, uh, industrial revolution per se or distribution of land and so you know the the, the conditions there are are almost feudal and um, young people at that time were caught up in what was happening in 1968 around the world and you know and they were part of that kind of major movement that was shifting a lot of paradigms um, and, it, and all of that was kind of cut short uh, across Latin America with the fear that socialism would take over and, you know, uh, and more Cubas would happen. 
Um, and my parents were were part of that movement. Um, and they were they were they were very scared. Um, so when when I was born, already they had had some um, interactions with um, the military. Um, they've been, you know, at protests where they've been arrested. And my mum talks about a time when the, the th she was thrown into the back of a um, a police car, and for some reason she wasn't hit, but the policeman was like hitting the girl next to her and punching another guy, and she was sort of in the middle. And, you know, um, and then they were taken for a night and there they encountered a young woman who um, was hooded up. And my father to this day still occasionally checks um, a website um, that, because the girl was from Sweden and he's always searching to see if somebody has declared her as missing. Um, so these were the stories that I was, you know, that I heard and that night that they were taken, um, they spent the night in jail and then they released them. And, um, my parents described that it was actually more terrifying the moment that they released them because they said, now you run. Yeah. And they would shoot you in the back and they would make it out that you had escaped. And so, you know, it was, it was those sorts of things that, um, you know, that, that, that was the climate that my parents were, were living within. Yeah, a brutal dictatorship. And I think, I think your parents were warned that they were on a list. Correct, by my uncle, who was a military man. So he said, you know, you guys are on lists and you you need to watch your backs, you need to be careful. And so my father who's a very bright man. Um, uh, he uh, applied to do a postdoc in Canada. And that's how we, we left um, in, the in 1980 uh, and lived in, in Canada for until 1983 when um, the um, democracy was reestablished and we returned. Mm. Um, yeah, and then, so there were a couple of times that we left and came back to Argentina. Mm. But you know the, the 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 fear that they felt during that dictatorship it never left them. So when they returned, it was like a sense of yes, there are there's more you know civil order, but we're not seeing major change. And we go out to rallies and we still see people who we know were secret police or you know could target you. And my mom could never let go of that fear. You know she mm. was obsessed that Marcus, my brother, and I would be taken. From her or something awful would happen. Yeah. So you landed in Brisbane in 1991 finally. Yes. Your family, I think, <laughs> didn't you? Yeah. Um, so quite a change of, and I guess Brisbane at that time in 1991 just opening itself up, you know, it was only, it was only two or three years after the fall of Joe Bjorki Peterson. And That's right. the, so the place was opening up in, you know, quite remarkable way so you did some study there didn't you yes so i um i did all of my high school there um when we landed in brisbane we my dad was working for the queensland university and so um the closest high school for us um was brisbane uh, was um Interpilly high mm -hmm. and um Interpilly high at that time had a, a reputation it was said to have uh, no uniform no discipline <laughs> <laughs> right. That must have appealed to you. <laughs> it certainly did. <laughs> so, and you know, I mean, yeah, I mean, there were some elements of the school that would could be described as a bit rough, but yeah. um, generally, it was a very liberal school. It had an amazing drama program, yeah. and the drama teacher there, um, Adrian Jones. Um, who's an important um, theatre and education figure in Queensland and nationally. Um, she was my teacher and, um, and she was the one that started talking to me about Augusta Boal and Bertolt Brecht and um, Joan Littlewood and, you know, these things just blew my mind, you know, and... Um, and when you were introduced to people like Bertolt Brecht and Augusta Boal and so on and, you know, who were, you know, theatre makers of politics, so I, I guess that really rang true for you as being a way for you as, an, as a you know, young person interested in theatre. Nikita, yes, this, this resonates for me, given your family background. Correct. Um, so can you, can you see a big connection between... Oh, absolutely, absolutely. So, you know, I, um, when I started studying these figures, my parents were all over this stuff, you know, even though they weren't theater makers or big theater consumers, um, they, they were aware of, um, of these voices. We had um, poetry by Bertolt Brecht around the house. You know, like, we're really true blue communists. Right. <laughs>
<laughs> and um, so we would have these really in-depth conversations about what it meant to make, you know, to tell stories of the underclass and 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 what the tools were, particularly in a country like Argentina, where you couldn't speak. You had to find really innovative and really um, covert ways of getting your politics across. So theater of the absurd was another one of these um, languages that were uh, favored during that time in um, of so much political instability and unrest and, and repression because, you know, the use of metaphor was critical to getting, a, you know, really powerful messages out there. Can I, can I talk to you a bit about that? Because your work, Ever since then, you know, when you're at university and right up to the very present moment has been quite political in, in all sorts of ways, um, but not, not polemic. And you're talking about how you kind of dress politics in a way. And you've found a way to, to speak politically, but uh, in very theatrical emotional ways is, is that is that been a very conscious thing for you um no not necessarily i mean if you saw some of the work i made at university it was like a lot of black arms <laughs> <laughs> right. um but you know uh, uh, i think one of the things that people forget about Bertolt brecht in particular is that he said the number one rule for making theater is entertainment yeah you know, so if it's not engaging and entertaining and, you know, making a smile or making us laugh or cry or moved in some way, it's, you're, you're never going to talk about anything, you know. And um, I know that there's this whole notion that he didn't believe in, you know, in emotion and you know, had to be all detached. And, and that's actually so far from the truth of what his practice was about. You know, and I always think about a quote by actually Augusta Boal, who says, you know, Brecht wanted us to cry not for mother courage, but for the system that made mother courage, mm. you know? And, and I always think about that in my work, you know, how can we kind of contextualize these characters in a broader um, situation where we can see power at play? So they're not just individuals, you know, taking advantage or feeling sorry for themselves. It's actually, we're part of a, a broader, um, a societal structure that leads to these kind of power plays. And that's what I'm interested in, in exposing, I suppose. And the other thing that really, really um, transformed my thinking around theater and politics was my collaboration with Angela Betsin, um, who's the, you know, one of the country's most, I think, best playwright. Um, and uh, she and I started in theatre for young audiences. And at that time, we wanted to get work into schools. And the school, um, uh, the loopholes for getting work into schools are so stringent, particularly in Queensland, where there was a lot of Catholic schools. And so you couldn't even mention the word ghost in, um, in a play. Right. Um, <laughs> and we were all about Gothic theatre, you know, so we were all about the ghost. <laughs> so, um, so we had to find a way around that to get, you know, political work that was, you know, sometimes quite confronting into these schools without getting parents, you know, sounding alarms and getting principals fired, you know, and, and we got very smart doing that, you know, we really relied on, on creating work that would allow audiences to fill the gap and work out what we were trying to say and do, mm -hmm. you know, and that meant being really visual, it meant, um, you know, relying on music, we, we, you know, language was very carefully crafted. So that was kind of, you know, my, my big learning on how to do that. Yeah, you, you, you studied with Angela Betsine, didn't you, at, at QT yeah. and um, set up that company called Real TV. Um, and under the banner of that independent company, you did a, like a lot of work together over a yeah. long period of time. Like that's, yeah. a, that's a really important director-writer relationship in your career, isn't it? Yes, very much, very much. Yeah, so we, um, the first thing we did, we made it at university and I was co-directing uh, with Lumine Burke. <laughs> um, and um, 
uh, it was then that we made this little work that um, we realized that we had a, a shared kind of passion for particular types of stories and and we started generating um, work in small festivals together um, through um, Metro Arts and um, and then from there we you know our work kind of started to get commissions and um, our, our first main stage gig was actually at La Watt. Um, and um, yeah, and it was a, a really formative time and a really extraordinary way to collaborate with mm. somebody. And you still very often work with them. So. Yes, that's right. Yeah, that's right. Um, you mentioned theatre for young people there because uh, in a lot of your work, there are a lot of children, you know, as kind of characters very often in a lot of the kind of work you do and also work, you know, about young people or specifically for young people, you know, like hoods or children of the dark shirt or I mean, a whole lot, a whole bunch yeah. of actually, yeah. like of, yeah. your, of your work. So that seems to have been a really conscious thing to make work yeah. for, for younger audiences. Yes. Like was that a, was, can you, do you think of that as a political thing or think of- Yes, oh know, yeah, very much. Um, we always, you know, considered children as the most vulnerable in our society. And so as a way to kind of highlight the conditions under which people are experiencing a variety of forms of oppression by centering, centri centering the child and the narrative, we were able to expose, a, you know, a, a whole lot of things that we felt were, you know, profoundly problematic. Um, and um, so, yeah, it was, a, it was very much a conscious choice. Um, you know, and children either appeared or, or, or were often referenced. So, so they might be a character that was a silent character, but it was always, you know, the work would often center around that. So, you know, mm -hmm. children of the black skirt and hoods have kids at the forefront and actors playing children. Um, uh, but also, you know, that's a kind of Brechtian technique in a way in that, you know, adults commenting on children and children commenting back on adults was a way of creating that sense of alienation, you know, to see, you know, power play. Right. Um, you also mentioned ghosts there too, when you're talking about, you know, kind of bad words to get into school yeah. in Queensland at that time. And actually from that very early time, right through to, to, to now, even in the work you're kind of in the middle of here at NIDA, ghosts, <laughs> ghosts are actually all over your work. I'm gonna say, no. and um, but that's very much an Australian tradition, actually. You know, the mm. tradition of the Australian Gothic, and uh, I remember Lydia Miller once, um, who's in charge of um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander arts in the Australian Council and a wonderful kind of artist in her own right, um, saying that uh, Australian Gothic was actually our national genre. Um, mm. You know, when you go back to Picnic or Hanging Rock or Wake in Fright or mm -hmm. uh, your own work or Secret River or Mad yeah. Max films or like it's just everywhere. Can you can you talk about that as a genre and what the Australian Gothic is to you as a genre? Yeah, I mean, in a way it was interesting because Angela, you know, w was the one that really was driving the, the Australian Gothic content, um, you know, in her writing and, and in the storytelling. Um, and then it was, it was, you know, we were trying to fuse it with a kind of Latin um, magic realism. Yeah. And so that's the kind of thing that we were looking at. And I was particularly interested in when this um, thing called the um, Argentine grotesque. And so, you know, we were, we were trying to kind of fuse these different sort of languages together. But the Australian Gothic um, is, is really a, a kind of manifestation of, of of the suffering that's taken place and is unresolved in this land. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, the way that we that it, we we kind of articulate that is perhaps in the way you know in the picnic picnic rock, it's essentially about white girls who get lost in the landscape and the landscape kind of consumes them and God forbid. And so, and but actually, that's a that's a comment about our relationship to Black Australia yeah. and our First Nations people and what and the terrible terrible thing that we have done here um and and so we were interested in that in that kind of I guess what it would be an original thing if you will that's still resonating so strongly and you know you in certain places it's been kind of stomped on more but in but as you leave the city 
it gets louder and it screams louder and louder. And so, you know, so we would go away to make work with Angela. Um, we would return to her place where she grew up, which was Rockhampton. And you could just, you could taste it, you could smell it, you could feel it everywhere. You know, you, the first image you would drive into Rockhampton and it would be police, you know, harassing young Aboriginal children, you know, and it was like, oh, just right there, you couldn't deny it, you know, and um, and that's what we were interested in and what, what, how that continues to kind of echo and resonate and, and speak and sound through, you know, the way that we're living our lives now. Yeah, and it's a very post-colonial kind of way of dealing with Australian history. And, you know, as you're talking about, or, or kind of uncovering unheard things and particularly to do with the landscape. Um, and I, had, I hadn't actually think of it. I hadn't actually thought of it in your, in your practice mixing that with um, a kind of Latin American magical realism. And that makes perfect sense to me. <laughs> Those two things, you know, this sort of tradition of Australian Gothic and magic realism, I can absolutely, absolutely see them kind of mm. coming together in a really interesting way. Mm. Yeah, and, you know, it just meant that we we were sort of liberated to, to start to play with the visual and, um, and the physical with actors and, and you know, uh, it, it kind of it, it felt comfortable to create a kind of transformative language where you know you would pick something up and it would it would have a life of its own like it's hard for me to explain but like for example children of the black skirt is all told through um little tiny sh like bed sheets and these bed sheets became costumes and they transformed characters in different ways and and became babies and you know and this thing would appear and then disappear and and it was that sort of stuff that allowed us to kind of traverse time and and place and and create different um little textural um, landscapes and it was just so joyous to theatricalize like that yeah Do you know, we've mentioned that show a few times just talk a little bit about that because that was about an orphanage wasn't it in rock Hampton? yeah yeah so um uh, so children of the black skirt especially a work that studied a lot in queensland it's in um study um books and, and in New South Wales, I believe it's on a study list as well. Um, and it, it's, um, it was inspired by, uh, at, when, we, when we created the work, um, it was when uh, the, the Royal Commission was coming out into children in, um, in orphanages and the treatment of, and, and stolen generations, but it, you know, the coming home report was, was um, you know, the, the big kind of foundation work that we were drawing from. Um, and so we wanted to look at um, orphanages as a kind of microcosm for, for Australia. And so all of these children that were um, stolen or dumped in there um, were, were of a particular race or class. And we wanted to talk about that in, in, and we wanted to kind of address our history across time through the, this institution. So um, Angela, as a child, had gone to an orphanage uh, when it had closed down in the very early 80s. She was like eight. And she, um, she was there for a, a, a oh, what's the, <laughs> um, for religious education during Easter. Thank you. That's what it was, Easter. And so and she remembers walking around at night through the, the, this orphanage um, and feeling presence, feeling the place was loaded. Anyway, and so when we decided that we would try and, you know, address this work and explore it, we went, you know, on a hunt of this orphanage and on the outskirts of Rockhampton. And it was near Col, which was a notorious, one of the worst, worst orphanages in this country. I mean, the history is excruciating to to go through and we had to we 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 would ask people in town how do we get to norton uh, to near Cole? and people would say why you want to go there and they were very suspicious eventually we got there we took a couple of actors we took a composer so there was about six of us and we roamed through the space and wrote and you know it was all very illegal and um it's now been demolished 
Um, but, um, and we took some elements from there as well that ended up in the show. But, you know, that experience really, um, it really set the tone for the show uh, as this kind of haunted space that would, you know, that when you stumble upon it, and that's the kind of basic plot, the three children find an abandoned orphanage and put on costumes that they find there and are transformed in back in time and become different characters of this, uh, that inhabit this world. And through them, they, they spend the night, every night, they hear a cry of a curlew and that brings a ghost back to life and they retell their story and release them. Amazing. I, I never saw that show, but that's that sounds amazing. amazing. It's amazing. Yeah. It's amazing. We still we sell videos of it and you know it's it's really beautiful. Mm. I'm extremely proud of that work. Yeah. Um I guess another Australian big Australian Gothic work for you, I guess, is the Drover's Wine. And um, which I did see, <laughs> and one of the most extraordinary productions I've seen in a long time. And I, I guess two. I guess there are two works that you've done recently um, directing um, Leah Purcell's adaptation or version of um, uh, Henry Lawson's Drover's Wife, which is an enormous success, and, and Leah giving one of the great performances, you know, in the, in the central role of that show. And the other, um, Barbara and the Camp Dogs, which is not Australian Gothic, but it's, you know, <laughs> like an extraordinary yeah. kind of show written by yeah. Lana and Ursula Jovic, um, like a great kind of musical. Yes. You know, rock kind of musical kind of thing, which is amazing success. But, you know, they're two of your great successes in the last couple of years and working fundamentally with First Nations artists. There, you know, Lee Purcell and Ursula and the cast and so on. And, um, and you've done that throughout your life, really. Um, so those two experiences, maybe talk about Drover's Wife for, for a start, because there was an, an, an extraordinary thing for Leah to do, to adapt that Henry Lawson short story and yeah. to make it fundamentally about, you all, in the way in which you were talking about this reading Gothic, you know, in terms of the, the hurt of the land and so on. So, yeah, yeah. Can you just share a bit about, you know, the experience of working with Leah on that? Oh. Yeah. <laughs> oh it's just one of those you know gifts that you get in your life you know yeah. um so so I got sent the script it was an early draft and um I remember reading it and thinking holy moly this is something else mm. and I called Lee and I said you know this feels like this feels like mother courage but it feels you know, it's, it's but it's smaller. It's and Bertolt Brecht actually has a play called um, um, Senora Carrara's Rifles, which is this tiny play um, about a mother who is in her hut during the the um, uh, the war, the Civil War, and refuses to let her sons go out to fight. And people keep coming into her hut and harassing her and saying, you gotta give over the, the rifles that you've got. You gotta give over your sons. And she said, no, no, I won't. And, um, and she's putting on this brave front. And in the end, of course, the war is encroaching and encroaching and she has no choice. And the, the comment being that, you know, uh, you can't have a revolution if you unless there's blood, there's going to be blood. And in a way it's the same with, um, with Leah's, the drover's wife, and that this woman denies, denies something that she knows deep in her bones about her struggle as a woman and her struggle as a First Nation woman. And when she's confronted by um, the truth through the character of Yedika, she then has to make a decision. Is she gonna continue to play as white woman and, and, and effectively be punished or is she going to join a revolution yeah. and continue a struggle that is waiting for her, you know? And so that's what I you know, just loved so deeply about the work, you know, that she, she was able to say so much in such distilled, beautiful, this beautiful narrative that was so familiar to all of us. And she was able to, you know, put women uh, you know, at the forefront and, you know, this kind of primal 
thing about motherhood and 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 keeping this tribe going mm-hmm. that she barely knew and you know it was it was like we all wanted to go out to the caves with her by the end of the show and some people say oh no they're going to kill her they're going to kill her but in my mind <laughs> she makes it right and she's there all cloaked up you know with her possum skins and you know and 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 her spear and you know she is she continues this the struggle of of Trigonini, you know, and, and these other legends. Yeah. An, ex- an extraordinary thing in the Australian theatre, I think, you know, kind of taking what's a, a white story, like a, a white colonial story from Henry Lawson, but but turning it into something much, much bigger. You know, I, I can never read that story again in the same way, you know, because no. of you've got the era and you've done with it. Yeah. Yeah. But, you know, interestingly, she and I both love the original story. Right. You know, there is a, you know, of course it's it's very problematic and racist, absolutely. But there is something in that voice and in that pain of that character, you know, abandoned in the middle of fucking nowhere, <laughs> dealing with fire and men and snakes and you know, that like makes you go, you know, stray and women. All right, you yeah. know, let's go. Yeah, yeah. And, and that's really admirable. And that's something that I know that Leah really respected of the of the original. And, you know, and that and and actually we found a quote that by Henry Lawson that says, you know, people need to learn their history for, you know, for the future's sake. And that's what he was trying to do, you know, capture time and not let us forget. Mm. Yeah, amazing. I think Lee's turning it into a film, isn't she? Yeah, she's turned yeah. it into a film. And yes. it, All right. yo, yeah, it's already been filmed and edited. And right. I, I got to the attachment on that, which was, you know, such a joy. I said to her, Leah, I don't care if I have to serve you coffee, I'll be in unit. I will give you lunch, but I am going to be on that film. And um, so she let me be in, involved in that. And um, it was stunning, stunning to watch her work. She directed it, she wrote it, she starred in it, um, she produced it. <laughs> and so um, yeah, one of the great performances I've seen. Like, really yeah. Exciting. You mentioned film there, and of course, you you have been working a bit in film in recent years, and and have just started working in virtual reality, artist in rather artist in residence at Start VR and working in in VR. So that's really it must be a really interesting area for you to be. Yeah, yeah, I was tricked, David. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <no>. <laughs> <laughs> I was told, oh, theatre directors will be really good at you know at VR because you know I have to think in three D and. It's not true. It's it is a language in itself, you know. Um, so it's I mean, in a way, what the advantage we have is that we don't think in in cuts, you know. We don't think about coverage, and we don't think about you know the, the edit point here. Um, so yeah, th- there's a camera. It's fixed, and you're telling a story in space, and you're in that virtual space. But there's a whole another kind of gamut of challenges that are set within that 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 um, language that um, it took me quite a long time to get my head around. Um, but if once you kind of spend enough time in there in, in the head space, in the head, wear, head gear, um, you start to realize that the language is so liberating. You have such an opportunity to, to travel in and out of um, space and through walls and, you know, um, things can come at you, you can be really small, you can be really huge. So it's a really exciting medium. It's expensive, but it's exciting. Yeah. Um, and I'm, you know, I'm still at early stages, but what's, you know, they they call it this big empathy, empathy machine. And, um, you know, and I'm like, you mean to the theater? <laughs> <laughs> right. Right. Wow. Yeah. Right, great. Um, we will have some time, some questions in a, in a moment from anyone listening, uh, either on Facebook or if you're on Zoom at NIDA. Um, but um, maybe you could just give us a little bit of stuff about the project you're working on at NIDA. 
and okay. uh, don't need to say much, but does it, what, what is it? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> no, no, no. I do know. I do know. Um, so, um, so I was asked um, by you if I would make something uh, with the 30 years acting students and um, the uh, creative um, school uh, that would have fit into a, a platform like Zoom um, and, uh, and communicate a story, I guess. And, you know, that was basically the parameters. It was pretty open. Um, I think you wanted us to be a little more interactive, but I've kind of ditched that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm terrible. Um, uh, but um, effectively, we, we, you know, uh, we've created a, a story that's trying to kind of address, um, you know, this, the, the anxieties that I'm certainly feeling at the moment. I, I'm back in lockdown um, here in Melbourne. And, um, and so, you know, in the way that the world is sort of changing, um, and so we're, we've created this, this um, story where we're trying to, we're trying to make, uh, I guess, use the horror genre to see if it can work on Zoom. And, um, and using um, horror and ghost stories to comment again on, on the state of the world that we're in and, and what we're, we're, where we're finding ourselves in 2020. Um, the kind of big... Um, influences that we have that we're you know dealing with is police brutality and um uh, and xenophobia and um and i guess we're you know we're, we're we're trying to kind of comment on on how insular we've become as a result of this pandemic um and yeah and so these uh characters meet uh, for a tarot reading, <laughs> oh. <laughs> and um, and this um, character that's never seen um, kind of draws out of these these people who are here to learn about the future, about how they can involve in shaping that future, I suppose, and what they can do about their and future. Very fifth window on Zoom, and no one knows who's there. That yes, right? that's right. That's right. <laughs> But she seems to know who's in there okay. very much. She knows a lot about what's going on. <laughs> so a bit of Australian Gothic there. Yes, that's right. Mm. And it runs for about um, 45 minutes and half of it is live and half of it will be pre-recorded, but hopefully it won't, you won't tell the difference between the two. Yeah. Um, and, um, you know, it gets pretty gruesome and interesting. It's very gruesome. I've read it. <laughs> very <laughs> gruesome. <laughs> and so how do people, how do audiences actually watch it? Uh, well, there'll be a, uh, an invitation yeah. uh, to a platform. I believe we're going to be um, using YouTube as a way to access it because uh -huh. um, it's the you know, most um, democratic platform that we found. And, um, you know, you can get the link and, and enjoy the show. Cool. All right. I'm sure we'll, we'll hear much more about that sort of over the next kind of week or so. Yeah. It's an extraordinary project, I must say. Like you've, you know, really created something special there. So I'm really oh. kind of seeing Well, it. let's hope so. I still have yeah. to direct it from, uh, you know, <laughs> remotely. <laughs> from isolation in, in, in Melbourne. That's right. So mm. let's hope I can pull it off. <laughs> yeah. Um, I want to talk I about. I should mention that, they, that I'm working with four writers who are from the oh, yeah. Masters program, and they are extraordinary. And it's super, super exciting that these voices are um, graduating and, and heading out into the world. And if I was anyone at night, I'd be like, mine. <laughs> That's four of the writers from, in the Writing Performance Masters. Course. Yeah, yeah. They're just awesome. Yeah, brilliant. Um, there's a question here about language in theatre. And of course, you're a Spanish speaker coming from Argentina. So if you, I think there's been at least one play, haven't you, where you've actually, with a Angela, I think, actually with Bettine, about using Spanish language as part of the language. And the question is about, do you think we're going to see more and more theatre that just as a natural thing has all sorts of different languages in it? 
Uh, I would hope so. Um, I was uh, involved in uh, a process of selecting new writers for development for Playwriting Australia. And um, some of the new writing that I was um, seeing, you know, putting forward for development had a lot of um, bilingual dialogue and um, it was so thrilling mm. um, and felt so natural at the same time. Um, so I would say so. And, you know, as, as, as the voices, you know, that that are coming forward um, certainly diversify, you know, considering the, the country that we live in, which is, you know, that over like something like sixty percent of people come from a non English speaking background, uh, you know, it's it seems sort of obvious that it, people feel very comfortable in in um, in writing, uh, you know, in, in, in multiple languages and even in, in the way that people are structuring certain phrases, you can tell that there's, you know, there's another way that people are thinking about communication that is not informed in, in you know, in, in, I guess, Anglo specific structure. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I would say so. And yes, I, I did do a little bit of, you know, uh, translating for Angela for Mortito. And I also translated, um, the mayors by Kate Mulvaney um, into yeah. fully into Spanish and had it read in in Spain in September last year. Oh, wow, I didn't yeah. know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was amazing. Mortito was about the cocaine trade, wasn't it? I think. Correct. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. Another big. Uh, yeah. Yes. Yeah, and uh, about a, <laughs> a guy was trying to set up a a, a cocaine enterprise in Sydney. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, here's another question about oh about Barbara and the Cantocks, which we didn't talk about before, but, but mentioned. And this, and this person says it was it was one of the best experiences I've had in a theatre. And what was it like working with Ursula Jovic? Oh, another dream. <laughs> yeah. Um, Ursula is warm and funny and smart and physical um and sassy the only thing that you know was a ch actually a challenge was saying to Ursula more be meaner <laughs> because she's actually a really good girl and she had to play this like you know tough dangerous wild girl and I was like Ursula let her out let her out so who, who are Barbara and the camp dogs tell us what that show is um, so uh, Barbara and the Cantogs is a story of uh, two um, sisters and they um, are singers trying to kind of make it in, in the scene in, in Sydney with their band, uh, the Cantogs, and um, they get uh, terrible, terrible uh, news that their, their mum is, is very unwell in, um, in Central Australia and they have, to, they have to go to say goodbye even though neither one of them wants to acknowledge that that's what they're doing. Mm -hmm. um, and Barbara has a lot of um, history with, um, with uh, Alice and desperately doesn't want to return, and, but has to. And so Renee, her sister, takes her kind of kicking and screaming. And, um, and so it's a, it starts off as a bit of a buddy comedy Mm. with these two you know girls trying to get back to the desert um but then um you know as they land first in Darwin and then make their way down to Alice we discover what the anxieties around returning home are for Barbara and and it's actually about her relationship with her um, biological mother and um and the trauma that she's experienced as a result of um intergenerational trauma from colonization. And so it just kind of gets deeper and more complex and, and darker and, and more painful. And, and the only way that this pain is kind of manifested is through outbursts of kind of, you know, mad sort of trouble from Barbara, but it's deeply rooted in this pain that she articulates through song. So it was, it was amazing what they, these women wrote together with uh, Elena Valentine. The lyrics, the story, it was beautiful. Essentially a concert, isn't it? Yeah, it is a concert. We kind of treated it like, you know, the show that the songs were like the album that was being released as a result of the journey back to see mum and say goodbye to mum. Mm. 
yeah. and in a way she was saying goodbye to two mums mm. and um and you know the songs were the records that she made as a result of that very painful difficult journey yeah and you can actually see the songs um, on, she's performing them on, in Merrickville. Uh, so if you want to get a full taste of, you know, just the music, um, yeah. look her up because it's on and you can watch it even from the comfort of your own home right. this Saturday. That's a, this Saturday, that's a good tip. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, cool. Um, here's another question about what sort of things have you been doing in lockdown? <laughs> You've got another six weeks ahead of you now, haven't you? Well, yeah. I mean, you show for night, that's, that's one thing. But like, um, yeah. And what things are you looking forward to? Um, what have I been doing in lockdown? Well, I've been doing a lot of development. Um, I've been reading a lot of plays. I've been doing some teaching online for VCA. Um, and um, I've been writing a lot of grants. <laughs> And um, I've, I've actually been in negotiations um, to do um, uh, some TV work. Um, so we're just, uh, I've been in writer's rooms for that, um, which has been extraordinary. And I'm hoping that in six weeks time, I will make it to Sydney to shoot this TV show. <laughs> right. Mm -hmm. um, so lots of a variety of different things. And the other thing that I've been doing is I've been trying to kind of you know, be in the present and enjoy some of this time. And so I've played the ukulele a lot, <laughs> right. okay. which I learned to do. <laughs> it is the instrument of the moment, isn't it? Ukulele. Well, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Not too many strings and <laughs> sort of tiny. <laughs> I think I was reading somewhere that the ukulele has become the most um, popular instrument in Australia over the last three years. Oh, that is so funny. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> It's a great instrument. I really recommend it. <laughs> I might try and find one. We can do a duet. Oh, yes. Okay. Stay tuned, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I guess the final question for you is, is really where you see theatre being in the next sort of 20 years or so. Can you see emerging, emerging trends? No? Um, uh, well, yes. I mean, look, uh, uh, emerging trends, you know, are that we're going to start to hear um, from, you know, that our theatre is going to become more multicultural, which is exciting. Um, and we're going to see stories that are going to be integrating a lot of technology in, in different ways. Um, and I think that's also exciting. Um, you know, younger writers are really integrating the internet in, in ways that are, um, you know, that are going to be a challenge for directors to theatricalize, um, but it's a welcome challenge. Um, and, um, but I think ultimately, well, I believe that we're going to be wanting to sit in a theater together and we're going to want to be completely you know um captivated by a story about about you know characters that we relate to that whether or not we've lived like them or not we will understand them mm -hmm. and we'll be um invited to hear them and you know that our imaginations will will go with them and i think that that is what we've been doing since the beginning of time. And I think that's something that we're hardwired for and we will always return to. So, you know, story, space, character, that's the future for me. Yeah, I'm with you on that too, I think, and all, all, all those things, yeah. Yeah. And can I teach you a great pleasure to talk with you? Oh, thanks, David. Nice. Thanks for asking me. Wonderful chat. Yeah, yeah. No, it's you, you, you a very fascinating story in your own right. Yeah. So <laughs> thank you. And thank uh, you. look forward to six, which is the name of your project at NIDA. And, and of course, all the work you're going to do in the future. So, you know. Thanks, Dave. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much for spending time with us. All right. Okay. Pleasure. Cheerio. Bye. Yeah.